Hi hey everybody, so we're in our second phase of thinking about analytical essays. So at this point, you have uh, started module number six and you are thinking about your topic sentences and the evidence that you're gonna be using in your papers, okay? So uh, you've already written your introduction paragraph, you've thought about the five, five approaches, uh, you have uh, reviewed the sample introduction paragraph, You've even thought about uh, the types of topic sentences that you would use in your essay in order to prove or to substantiate your thesis statement. Uh, we covered quite a bit about body paragraphs in the last uh, webinar. All right, so we, we stopped with this idea, uh, developing body paragraphs within an essay. Uh, we reviewed quite a bit of information about topic sentences. We understood how those topic sentences are illustrated, and that's through evidence. And then we thought about how explanations work in this process, all right? So essentially what you're doing whenever you're writing the body paragraph is that you're asking, or you're answering rather, for your audience, what's the point of this paragraph? Can you give me an example? And how does your example establish your point? And so these things are key uh, to this process, just understanding how that works. Um, so after that, you should have tried to construct, uh, you should have tried to construct a body paragraph where you thought about your topic sentence and then you started the process of uh, providing evidence. And this is gonna come from your source material that you use for the research proposal, uh, annotated bibliographies, and the preliminary bibliography. So you're pulling from all of those um, sources or all of those resources in order to provide evidence. And I wanna spend a lot of the time that we have today in our webinar talking about evidence. And the reason that is is because I've had a few uh, analytical essay conferences this week, and I've answered quite a few questions back and forth about evidence. And these are super, super, super questions. And I thought that spending more time talking about evidence today uh, would be beneficial to all of us. Um, I think that we understand about explanation uh, based upon what we learned in module number five with the claim evidence and warrant short answer assignment. We really spent a lot of time thinking about how to explain how evidence uh, can be used in order to support a, a claim. One of the other things that we talked about in the last webinar was significance and how to use a sentence to draw the reader back into uh, the main idea of your essay by, by making sure that that body paragraph connects back to the thesis statement. And so we talked about significance uh, in the last webinar. And that's kind of the new thing that we learned for this particular unit. Um, and then, as always, conclusion statements are optional, and they should mainly be used just to uh, take one paragraph uh, and close it out with with a conclusion, if you will, and then and then take the reader into the next paragraph by offering some sort of transitional idea. All right, so uh, conclusion statements work well there. As I talk about conclusion statements in body paragraphs, I'd like for all of us to note that a great place to use a conclusion statement is between body paragraph one and body paragraph two, and between body paragraph two and body paragraph three, if you have three body paragraphs. If you have more, then you can use it at the beginning of your body paragraph sequence, or you can use it at any point before you get to the very last body paragraph. You do not want to use a conclusion statement in your very last body paragraph because you're about to conclude your paper. So there's no need to necessarily have one. Um, I think it always works best uh, right in the middle uh, between paragraph two and three uh, if you're doing three body paragraphs. So that's just something to keep in mind as well. It's just a little tip. Are there any questions over anything that we've covered so far or anything that I just mentioned before we go into any new information and knowledge? Okay. All right, so uh, everyone in the chat says it's okay, so I'm gonna keep going. 
All right, so this is one of those rather long uh, and lengthy pages. Uh, I considered breaking this into two pages and I still might once our video uh, webinar is over, uh, but right now it's all one page and, and, um, and we're gonna go through this information and then I'll make a game time decision regarding if it's gonna stay uh, in this form. Uh, but for now, I want to introduce us to how to incorporate secondary sources as evidence, okay? So what I want us to get out of this is I want us to know when to directly quote, when to summarize, and when to paraphrase, all right? So keep in mind that the reason you're using evidence is so that you can uh, offer ethos, if you will, to your argument, right? So whatever it is that you're proving in your topic sentence, you want to have some secondary support to say that what you're saying is valid, okay? And it, and it also communicates that I can trust you as, a, as your reader and as your audience. Um, so let's connect what we've already learned um, in our previous essays to where we're going right now. Um, in the research proposal essay, your evidence was offered uh, as summarized, broadly written ideas about the sources that you researched, okay? Uh, please say in the chat if you understand this concept. Just say yes or no, uh, and then that way we'll know that we are translating what we previously learned to, to what we're learning right now. Do you recognize this? Okay, good. Okay. So now, uh, for the analytical uh, assignment, we are going to use more specific, directly quoted information, okay? So we're gonna look at the statistics, we're gonna look at the testimonies, we're gonna look at uh, the facts, we're gonna look at all of this information that was given to you in the sources that you read, all right? And what your goal is, is that you want to use this information responsibly. You don't want to just quote a ton of information for your evidence and then also quote again for your explanation and quote again just to, you know, create significance and get back into the thesis statement and consistently rely on the secondary sources words. You want to get out of this way uh, of communicating and you only want to use just what you need from the secondary source. Instead, you want to summarize and paraphrase when needed in order to provide an explanation or in order to set up the context for the quote, okay? So you're still using summary and paraphrase, but I wanna talk about how to use it responsibly. Now, this is a slight diversion from where I was last week. Last week, I really didn't want you to use summary and paraphrase at all because I know it can get us into a lot of trouble in college because some of us sometimes will, will inadvertently uh, you know, patch plagiarize. And when you try to summarize, but you use too much of the original information, or when you try to paraphrase, but you really don't put the information in your own words enough, then you can get cited for patch plagiarism. If you forget to put a parenthetical citation at the end of your summary or at the end of your paraphrase, you can get cited for plagiarism. So because it's such a slippery slope and because I'm so protective of all my students, I really want you to directly quote. However, after looking at some of the assignments uh, from the short answer response, I feel that we're too heavily uh, dependent on copying and pasting or quoting the secondary source. And I want you to find your own voice and feel comfortable and safe in it. So I'm gonna offer you this information so that you can do this and do this responsibly and do it well. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, so in the, in, in the chat, you guys are saying that this makes sense to you. All right, so uh, for the analytical assignment, uh, we are going to be incorporating evidence into our essay. The reason we're going to do this uh, basically folds out in four ways. Number one, we're gonna offer evidence that agrees with our stance up to a point, okay? So you can offer the evidence and then you can say more about the evidence. So you can quote something and then talk a little bit more about what it is that you've quoted and you can make your own argument or make your own point from there. Does that make sense? Okay, good. 
The second way that you can use evidence and incorporate it in your essay is that you can present evidence that contradicts your stance and then argue against it. And you do this in the form of a counter argument, right? So if you disagree with something or you have or, or you have a source that disagrees maybe with what it is that you want to write about for your right for a cause uh, topic, you can actually use the information that they give you and then you can knock it down and say why it's wrong. Or you can do as the second or as this third idea suggests, you can then offer another source that disagrees with that source. And so you can pit the sources against each other in order to develop uh, your topic sentence. Does this make sense at all to everybody? So uh, you're saying that because I do, well, because my uh, essay kind of, because my, what's it called? My um, sources and stuff has mm -hmm. two like parts to it where one is talking about one thing and then my other sources is talking about the other thing. Mm -hmm. So could I have those two kind of argument each kind of in a way? Like Ab have one paragraph Ab talk about one? Absolutely. Then, okay. Absolutely. You can do that. You can set up the first source and you introduce it and say who this person is, give their credentials, and then you can set up the second source. You remember Ige Guabadilla does this in Spoils of War, Repatriation of Benin Kingdom Artifacts. She puts these sources next to each other and she just lets the sources kind of fight it out, right? Um, and that's a great way to do it. The main thing that you're gonna need between the sources is a transition word to demonstrate that they are opposite each other. You would wanna use a word like however, or on the other hand, or despite this fact, uh, said author thinks this way. You understand? So you want to make sure that you're creating the relationship between the two sources if you put them next to each other. After that, then you're gonna to need to provide your way in on how these two sources contradict each other. You're going to need in your explanation to make clear which one or which idea should be considered. Now, in the analytical paper, uh, you're going to have to do this carefully because you have to remain in the objective tone. So you can put these two ideas next to each other, but you still got to stay neutral in how you're presenting things, right? Um, so if the facts, still line up with where you want your audience to be. So if you're trying to secretly, if you will, <laughs> get them to agree with what it is that, that you're promoting, then you're going to have to still communicate it objectively, but in your explanation, you're going to have to reason why this, this one idea may be superior to the other, but you gotta be a little secretive with it. Does that make sense at all? Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, you're welcome, you're welcome. Okay, so this is a cool way to kind of build out evidence in your paper, right? So another thing you can do is you can use quotations to support your assertion, okay? Uh, not merely to restate uh, your claim, okay? So this is fourth for me because this is maybe the most obvious of all ways to use secondary sources just to support what you're already saying in your topic sentence so i think everybody understands this we've done this before right right <laughs> okay thank you guys in the chat okay so we're pretty familiar with this idea does anyone have any questions over when to uh, incorporate evidence in your essay and how to do it. Does anyone have any questions over these four, four, four skills? Okay, thanks guys. All right, let's look at the next part. All right, so what are the differences between quoting, paraphrasing, and summarizing? Um, keep in mind that quotes um, should be identical to the original uh, information. So it should literally be, if you will, copied and pasted or written exactly as it was uh, in the original source. The only thing that we change that up is if you use something called ellipsis. And those are the three little dots that remove information from the original source, I'm sorry, from the original quote, uh, because that information is not necessary 
to what your point is for that paragraph. So ellipses are your friends. However, ellipses can also be your enemies if you use those ellipses and you take information out uh, that changes what the author was really trying to say with the quote, right? So you can't change the meaning of the quote. You have to just maybe take out information that's not needed, right? So you can do that, but you wanna keep that quote as original as possible. Are there any questions about direct quotes and how they should work? Okay, great. Paraphrasing. The paraphrasing is the new kid on the block for us because we've worked with summarizing before. We've worked with direct quotes before. Paraphrasing is extremely scary for me and I hate to teach it, mainly because I've seen students who have, uh, you know, had a couple of missteps with paraphrasing and ended up in the Dean of Students office for plagiarism, right? Um, and not, not only my students, um, you know, and, and I've never sent a student, by the way, to the Dean of Students office for plagiarism. I try to work through those details with you while you're in class with me so that you don't accidentally do it in another teacher's class. So I wanna make sure I'm clear there. But I had a student um, who was a former student um, and she had me for a class that wasn't related to uh, English. It was, uh, I was teaching a college success course, uh, and it was a few years ago. But she told me in the college success uh, course that she had gotten reported to the Dean of Students from her uh, history professor for plagiarism. And she asked me if I would look over the information with her and if I would help her kind of understand and figure it out. And the problem is that the student uh, paraphrased and she used some of the original work or some of the original specific terms from the secondary source. And her history teacher cited her for plagiarism. And in fact, the history teacher was right. It was patch plagiarism. And so after that, and this is again many years ago, I really, you know, kind of pulled off of the whole paraphrasing thing. However, I want to come back and I want to, you know, take this journey with you guys. So let's kind of look at what paraphrasing is. Keep in mind my story so that you use it uh, responsibly and you kind of understand what it is uh, that you should be doing. All right. All right, so let's take a look at, at paraphrasing. Paraphrasing involves putting a passage from a source uh, or rather source, source material into your own words. A paraphrase must also be attributed to the original source, right? So you still have to cite or you still have to use a parenthetical citation if you, if you paraphrase. Paraphrase material is usually shorter than the original passage, uh, taking somewhat a broader segment of the source and condensing it slightly. Okay, so it's it's almost like you're looking at the sentences that are there and then you are rewriting those sentences in your own words. Okay, so when you do that, you are substituting words, you are rephrasing ideas, and you are usually making it more simple for your audience to understand the very complex thing or, or, or the more complex idea uh, that was given to you in the source. Does that make sense at all? Okay, I wanna hear from everybody in the chat that you understand that. <laughs> I'm very leery about teaching this because I don't want you guys to get in trouble for making mistakes. Do we all understand this? Will you need us to paraphrase? No. Is it optional? It is optional. Okay. And and, and, and it's a gamble, right? So if you paraphrase, here's the times when you should do it. If you're gonna paraphrase something, then maybe you paraphrase uh, a general idea uh, that sets up the context for the quote that you're going to give. Does that make sense at all? Yes. Okay, good. Okay. So, so you don't need to necessarily cite something like there are 26 letters in the alphabet. Everybody knows this, so there's no need to cite something like that. But if, you're going to, but if you're going to tell me something very specific about which civilization first created the letter R, and you know, only these researchers believe this civilization actually set up the letter R, then I'm gonna need you to go ahead and give me a parenthetical citation uh, for, you know, to cover that very specific information, especially because it's not a widely held idea. Just these researchers think this. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Okay, wonderful. Okay, all right, so 
that's when you paraphrase, okay? And you wanna make sure that you are not taking large chunks of the original information and not breaking that down and just leaving it at it as is and then paraphrasing the words around it, all right? That's where you fall into patch plagiarism and that's the only thing I have to say about this idea. Any questions? <laughs> okay, great, let me move on. Summarizing. So you already understand summary. Summary is just where you take, you know, a lot of smaller ideas and you give a, you give a large overarching broad idea instead. Okay. Again, whenever you summarize, you want to make sure that you give a parenthetical citation for the information that you've summarized. Now, I've had students ask me in conferences, you know, do I give a parenthetical citation for every sentence that's affiliated with what I've summarized? So if I have three sentences that are summarizing maybe four paragraphs worth of work, do I put a parenthetical citation at the end of each sentence? That's a great question. What I would prefer that you do is to introduce the source and then offer the information and put the parenthetical citation at the end. What would be helpful to protect you and to communicate to me what you're doing is that you tell me that this is a summary. You can say things like a summary of Hegel's theory for, you know, uh, abolishing um, sociological ideas attached to uh, pandemics. Uh, stems from his research on uh, life uh, as a global citizen. And then you just tell me kind of what his theory is, and you can summarize that, and then you put the information at the end. All right. So that way you've communicated to me that this comes from a large span of work and you're just giving it as a, as a single thought or a single few thoughts in a few sentences. Does that make sense? If it doesn't, now it's a good time to say that. Um. So. Um. I kind of have a question about that. So. Yes. Um, so what you're saying is, um, I can like, have like one big article and then put that whole information at the very end, or. Um. Like, what do you mean, like? If you're if you're using a summary pattern, then you would maybe just want to give me the main idea of that entire article. Okay. Instead of maybe giving a large chunk of information that's summarized from the article. So what we're doing is we're actually moving away from what we did in the research proposal essay, where you gave me several sentences that you summarized from the article. Mm -hmm. Instead, you're moving into only communicating via summary if you're giving me a large, broad uh, piece of information condensed to maybe a single sentence or two. So because you were talking about at the beginning, so if you want to introduce the, like, the author, once you have, well, the title of what you want to talk about, don't you have to put that in quotation? Right, well, well the article itself will go in quotation marks. Okay. That's just because that's the way you punctuate articles. Okay. But the summary sentence does not necessarily go in quotation marks. Instead, the summary sentence is your own sentence. I think that using summaries is best whenever you are setting up the context for a direct quote. Write okay. that down in your notes somewhere. I think that summaries in, uh, in, in essays where you can directly quote are best used in order to set up context, in order to introduce the quote, in order to talk about maybe what you know, is prompting you to give this quote. I mean, of course, you're not going to announce that this is prompting you, but you want to set it up to where I see where this direct quote comes from. I see kind of where you were going with your thought process. That's what context sentences do. Does that make sense, everybody? I never know. Does it make sense? Okay, I, I got one yep. Okay, and I got a yes and a thank you. Okay, good. Okay, good. All right. So are we clear about quoting, paraphrasing, and summarizing everybody? 
Okay, great. All right, so here's just a general idea of where you would use uh, quotes and summaries and paraphrases. Um, I won't go through all of this. I really want to focus on what we need for this particular assignment that we're working on, okay? So I'll let you guys read this part on your own. Um, I wanna get to this part. It says, in research papers, you should quote from a source for the following reasons. Number one, to show that an authority supports your point, key. Two, to present a position or argument to critique or comment on. Three, to include specific, I'm sorry, especially moving or historically significant language. Or four, to present a particularly well-stated passage whose meaning would be lost or changed if paraphrased or summarized. Okay, for our paper, these two top ones are going to be uh, the most appropriate. Okay, these last two, maybe so, but maybe more so in another class. You should summarize or paraphrase uh, when what you want from the source is the idea expressed, not the specific language used to express it. And again, this is gonna take us back to what we said about setting up context for directly quoted information. Sometimes you just need the idea to set up the context to introduce the direct quote. Um, or you can express it in fewer words uh, instead of using the words from uh, the key I'm sorry, instead of using the words from the original source. So you can use key points uh, instead of all of the words that the original source used. And again, that's gonna work specifically for summary. Um, now, here's a little caveat. Summary and paraphrase will be your primary methods for communication in life. This is true. When it comes to college writing, you wanna make sure that you protect yourself from patch plagiarism. So you want to know when and where to do this, all right? So um, one of the comments that we had before our webinar started today was like a, a lot of information uh, given on um, individual pages in the module. And I was very sensitive to that too, because I don't want you guys you know, having to read more than what you absolutely need. If you want to know more information about uh, summary, paraphrase, and direct quotes, and when to do that. Uh, I'm offering a page from the University of Wisconsin, which by the way is an amazing school, go Badgers, um, regarding when to quote, paraphrase, and summarize, okay? So if you follow this link, it'll take you there, and you can learn a whole lot more, all right? Um, feel free to use this as a resource if the information I've given you here didn't quite scratch your itch, if you will, all right? If you wanna know more, go there. All right, let's talk about citing your sources, okay? So uh, there are a few ways to cite your sources. Uh, one of the things that we've learned in this course is the importance of introductory phrases. The reason I emphasize introductory phrases so much is because again, it keeps you out of hot water if for some reason you accidentally plagiarize, okay? Uh, the fact that you have introduced the source and at least told the reader where the source uh, originated helps you if for some reason you forget to use a parenthetical citation or if you forget to use quotation marks properly um, or if you accidentally accidentally paraphrase or summarize in an inappropriate way it at least gives you a leg to stand on when you get uh, in a situation okay so it also helps you to develop what's called ethos right so it gives your your work or your source material credibility, okay? So you wanna use those introductory phrases that we worked on actually since the beginning of this semester. Uh, the next thing this section is going to talk about is punctuation, all right? And it's gonna give you a few examples and we're gonna go through a quick checklist. So let's look at this example. It says, according to child psychologist, Dr. James Gleick, the author of Faster, we are consumers on the run. The very notion of the family meal as a sit-down occasion is banishing. Adults and children alike uh, eat on the way to their next activity. 
Okay, so let's break this thing apart. The first thing we have is our introductory phrase, all right? We see that Dr. James Glyke is a child psychologist, and we also see that he wrote a book called Faster. We know this is a book because it's italicized. Long works are italicized, all right? We also see that this has been attributed to Glyke, and I can find this information on page 148. This is available in the parenthetical uh, citation. Are there any questions about the introductory phrase in the parenthetical citation? Okay, great. Now, let's talk about the punctuation. So when you have a direct quote, there are a few things you need to be aware of. First of all, the comma. After the title of the source, you offer a comma before opening your quotation mark, all right? I look for this comma when I'm grading your work because it's a punctuation rule. Uh, our next lab is gonna talk about uh, punctuation. So, uh, I'm sorry, it's gonna talk about commas. And so you'll see that, that this rule uh, will be there for you. Um, here, you need to open and close your quotes, okay? So when you're opening and closing quotes, you want to make sure that you give a space before that open quote and a space after before you give your parenthetical citation. All right. The next thing we notice in this is that we have ellipsis. I talked about ellipsis a little bit earlier, the little dot, dot, dot thing. All right. So the dot, dot, dot thing is meant, again, to substitute for the words that would be between, for instance, run and the. There are other words that Glyke included that this uh, example did not need. Uh, also, here, with ellipsis, you see that there's space between um, eat and on. And so with that, you don't need to include that information if it doesn't make your point. However, keep in mind that with ellipsis, you have to make sure that the words that you omit don't change uh, the meaning or the words that you omit uh, don't necessarily have vital information that would change the understanding or the way that this quote is received. We have a question in the chat and it's a great question. It says, do we need to include the occupation of the author? Well, let's see. If I gave you the same information and I just said, like the author of Faster, you wouldn't know necessarily who Glyke is, right? So you could take the quote as it's given with just this random person named Glyke or James Glyke. But if you know that he's a child psychologist and that he has his PhD or his MD, then that helps us to understand that we can probably trust what you're saying a little bit more, right? So I like to see um, who these authors are or where this study was done because it gives greater ethos to your work. Um, is it completely necessary? No. Is it better than not doing it? Yes. Does that answer your question? Okay. All right. So the next uh, thing that we want to pay attention to is the parenthetical citation. In the parenthetical citation, you have the author's last name and you have the page number and you have parentheses around both. Notice that the period, which is the last part of punctuation that we should consider, is after the parenthetical citation. It is not inside of the quotation mark. It's way over here, okay? So there are a couple of things though to consider and I mentioned it down here. Um, for those of us who are, who are gonna read this after the webinar. A couple of things to consider is that if the information inside of the, parent, inside of the quotation mark ends with other forms of punctuation like commas, question marks, or exclamation points, it will go inside of the quotation mark. All right, so it will go in here. Right, and, that, and let's look at an example. It's down here. Everybody see it? Okay. Let's look at this one. For example, in his text, Faster, James Glyke asks, are we now a nation of consumers on the run? So notice that the question mark is right here, 
And then notice that the period is out here. See that? Okay, so if you have a comma, it would work that way. If you have uh, an exclamation point or a question mark, it would work that way. All right, but at the end of it, you should have your period out here. While I'm on it, let me say a note about uh, using commas here and then picking up on uh, more information that you want to quote, um, maybe in a second quote. My suggestion is for MLA audiences particularly, we don't love it whenever you add a comma here and then you continue with another quote. We prefer the ellipsis idea, which is uh, what's going on up here, right? Because we understand that there are thoughts in between um, and we give you space for that. Um, if you're going to use a comma here and then pick up on the idea later, just use ellipsis, close the sentence, and then open a new sentence. It's just better for us. For APA audiences, which you would use for maybe a psychology class, a sociology class, education class, uh, it's, it's more acceptable to use the comma uh, with a parenthetical citation and then pick up on um, the next quote without having interu any interruption in your sentence. Does everybody understand that? No, okay, all right, I got one no and that's okay. Let's look at this again. Okay, all right, so let's look at it again. Okay, so if we look at this example, in his text faster, James Blake asks, are we now a nation of consumers on the run? So if it ends with a question mark, then you would go ahead and put the question mark in here and then you would use a period out there. Now, I'm not sure if you didn't understand that part or if you didn't understand the comma thing, so I'm gonna go over the comma thing next. If you use a comma here because you want to add on another sentence, say you want to add a sentence right here before you got to like, right? It's better that instead of using a comma, and then offering a parenthetical citation for glyc, it's better that you use ellipsis. Remember the ellipsis is the, where is it, it's up here, the dot, dot, dot. Instead, put the ellipsis here, and then continue on with whatever else you want to quote inside of the parent, inside of the uh, quotation marks. So you just pick up on additional uh, evidence by using ellipsis because we will know that you are omitting some information and only including the necessary information from the next part of the quote. Does that make sense? Okay, great. All right. Now, no one asked this question, but I'm going to address it. So say you do that and say you're at the end of page 148 and then the rest of the quote picks on, on page 149. All you have to do is say 148, use a hyphen, and then go to 149. All right, does everyone understand that? Okay, thank you guys in the chat. All right, so um, I'm just going to kind of point out a couple of things here. I'm not going to go into great detail because our time is almost up, and I did want to spend the majority of our time today talking about uh, how to incorporate evidence into your uh, information. Um, but let's take a look. A couple of other ways to do this. You can um, introduce your source, which would be James Gleick here. There's his book, Faster. And then you can just use just the number of the page without including the author's last name. That's an option. Uh, you only want to do that if you introduce the source before the quote. You also only want to do this uh, if you're using a single source in the paragraph. Okay, if you're using multiple sources in a, in a given paragraph, I would suggest that you use the first format with the author's last name and page number, just so that your audience is not confused. 
Are there any additional questions about when to use the single number as opposed to uh, the author and page number for your parenthetical citation? Okay, great. All right, so uh, I've already talked about uh, ellipsis, so I'm not gonna go into a lot of that. Um, and I'm gonna move on to uh, your, your next um, idea. So the next idea is for us to talk about oversighting. I found a video uh, from Ashford uh, University. They did a really good job of talking about the danger of oversighting. It's two women from the Writing Center and they are talking about how to best approach it. Oversighting is a big deal uh, in my class and in all other English professors' classes. Most of our students don't trust themselves and so they cite, 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 cite uh, to make sure that their paper sounds good. But what it ends up sounding like to us is that you're afraid to speak and use your own voice and so you cite it. So this video will help you kind of get over the hump of oversighting and it will give you um, a greater sense of trusting your own voice. Oh, there's a question in the, cat, in the chat. What do I mean by oversighting? Oversighting is when you use the secondary source not only to quote for evidence, but you also use the secondary source and, and, and the language from the secondary source in your explanation, in your warrant. You constantly rely on the secondary source to talk for you. That's oversighting. A lot of students do this, all right? They think it makes their paper sound better, but what it makes them sound like is that they are afraid to write and use their own voice. They don't trust themselves. So you want to make sure that you only cite absolutely what's necessary, and then you use your voice in order to write your explanation. Say it yourself. I should see a difference between the author's voice and your voice when I'm reading your paper. I should know when you're speaking. Does that make sense? Okay, this is a huge deal, and it's something I really want all of us to work on uh, as we get ready to close out the semester. Okay, so here's your checklist. Um, your checklist ask you to think about have you offered evidence to substantiate your topic sentence or your assertions all right uh, the next thing you want to ask yourself is do i thoroughly explain why or how my evidence backs up my ideas all right so you want to make sure that you're checking for that next do i avoid generalizing in my paper by explaining specifically how my evidence is representative all right, so you got to deal with those specific words in your evidence. We worked on this in, uh, in the previous module for short answer response, and we want to make sure that we're aware of it even here. And then next, do I provide evidence that not only confirms but qualifies my paper's main claims? In other words, am I citing just to be citing or am I citing information that really helps me to understand or really helps my audience to understand or see what I'm talking about in my topic sentences? Next, do I use evidence to test and evolve my ideas rather than to simply confirm them? Again, your topic sentence and your evidence should be fully explained and pushed forth in your warrant also known as your explanation. So you should be moving me through your ideas as you, and taking authority over your ideas as you write your explanations and explain your evidence. And then finally, do I cite my sources thoroughly and correctly? Again, this is something you want to be aware of uh, as you start to think about how much information you should use whenever you're citing. Right? How much are you putting in and how much are you taking out? Are you using ellipsis properly, et cetera? So this is your revision checklist. Are there any questions about the revision checklist? Okay, great, you guys are awesome, thank you. Okay, let's look at the plagiarism check. So I'm not gonna go into a lot of this. I've already talked about plagiarism a lot. And I've also given a qualifier for everything that I said at the beginning of this webinar uh, in terms of uh, using other people's words responsibly. So there's my disclaimer here at the bottom. This is a really cool discussion about uh, dealing with plagiarism. Grammarly offers it. And um, at the end of this discussion, um, they, 
I believe, offer uh, some tips on how to do it um, and then, or, or how not to do it. <laughs> and so I think it goes into an even deeper discussion than what I offered uh, today, all right? So it's a great resource if you feel like you need it. Are there any questions about incorporating secondary information into your essay? Okay, really fast. Um, I'm just gonna show you what we're gonna cover in the webinar that I offer next week. Uh, there's your sample body paragraph draft and all that. Um, there's your RTL lab coming up next, which should already be done, hopefully at this point, on subjects, um, predicates, sentence fragments, and run-ons. Here is uh, information for the Zoom meeting that we're currently having, but alas, here is what we will cover next week, and that is going to be conclusion paragraphs. If you can't wait until next Wednesday for our discussion on conclusion paragraphs, feel free to look at this information. As always, it's color-coded so that you can see the different uh, parts of the conclusion paragraph. And I have four ways that I'd like for you to consider. I'm sorry, I have one, two, three ways I would like for you to consider um, writing your conclusion paragraphs, okay? So there's a little preview for what we'll cover next week. And as you get ready to have your meetings with me, I want you to keep this information in mind and write a strong body, write strong conclusion paragraphs. Are there any questions for me as we close out our time today? I know we've already been over this, but what's the difference between the analytical essay and the argumentative essay? Because they both seem pretty persuasive. Well, your analytical essay is not supposed to be persuasive. That's the major difference. Your analytical essay is meant to be informative. It's only supposed to give me information without trying to persuade me to do anything. Okay, and the, the thesis statement though, that's not supposed to be persuasive? No, your okay. thesis statement should not be persuasive. It should be informative. So you should just be giving me one narrowed aspect of whatever you came up with for your hypothesis from the research proposal. Just narrow down one aspect of it and just give me the facts about it. Okay. So we, we shouldn't be saying things like, I believe? No, no. Okay. Remember, this is written in the objective tone, and the objective tone is going to be standing on the outside of your topic, looking at it as an observer, and simply telling me, your audience, what you see. Your so the analytical is essay is supposed to be a completely different topic than the essay that we're doing for our, some, uh, our final? Yes, the analytical okay. essay should be one narrowed aspect, one small chunk of the information that you gave me in the uh, research proposal, right? Okay. So remember, you have a couple of ways you can do that. Um, we talked about it uh, last week. I just want to point it out to you so that you see it. Um, that would help a lot more than you think it would. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Okay, so if you go back uh, to your homepage and you go into Oh, everything open here and you go into um, here we are yep into module number six <clears throat> so we talk about it here in the introduction kind of the difference in what and what you're doing okay um, and there's a difference between the argument uh, final exam and also the analytical essay remember here are the details for the analytical right okay so that's one thing just to kind of support that idea the second thing is how do you arrive at your thesis statement which would kind of guide where you're going with your essay uh, where are we there we are um, there we are introduction paragraph structure so here <clears throat> it literally goes over the process for finding your analytical thesis statement. All right. And it says to narrow the topic by choosing a single aspect of the hypothesis for the analytical essay. And then it says focus on just one idea mentioned in the research proposal. 
right, and then so we're writing a paper about one of the things that we're going to be using in our final. You're writing a, no, because you don't have to use anything. <clears throat> you don't have to use information from your research proposal specifically in your final. You get to write for your cause. So all of the breaks are put off, are taken off and you can go at it however you see fit. Oh, okay. See, this one is intentionally saying narrow it down. And one of the things I was going to mention a second ago is, is, it, is, is that it says consider one of your topic sentences. Because the topic sentence has already narrowed your, is a, is a more narrowed version of your hypothesis from the research proposal. You've already kind of done the work and you already have the sources sitting there waiting on you. Right? Because you've already discussed this and that's just a quick way to arrive at uh, your thesis statement for your analytical essay. All right. I think I have a better idea of what I'm supposed to be doing now. Okay. All right. So, yeah. So, you want to narrow it down. You're only giving me a single aspect. Just keep that part in mind if you don't keep anything else in mind. Right. For your argument essay, you are throwing everything at me but the kitchen sink. You're coming at me with everything you want to say. And you now have all of this research to back whatever it is that you want to talk about. So you can leave your right for a cost topic as broad as it is and give me a thesis statement that tackles all of what you want to say. Or you could look at it and say, you know what, that's going to be a super long paper. I don't want to spend that much time on it. I would rather narrow it to just this aspect and I want to write for this cause now. Does that make sense? Right. Right or yes? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll make sure. <laughs> Okay, are there any, any other questions? These are great I'm questions. paying attention. I just can't talk. Um, <laughs> oh, no, you can oh, go first. Oh, thank you. I'm a little confused. I was going to do, well, my right for a cause topic has been why nuclear energy is a better source of energy. Mm -hmm. But I'm a little confused how not to do that persuasively, though. Well, you're not going to tell me that it's a better source of energy. You're just going to give me the details on nuclear energy. Okay. That makes sense? Yeah. And so you kind of are leaving it to me to look at all of these facts and say, hmm, I bet that's better than other forms of energy. Oh, but you okay. don't tell yeah. me to think that way. You're just telling me these are the facts about nuclear energy. Mm -hmm. And these are the facts about this sort of energy. Here are the facts, Candace. You figure it out. Does that make sense? Yes, that makes sense. Think about Barbadia and how she approaches um, the, the, rep the repatriation of, of the Benin Kingdom artifacts. She never tells us if they should be returned or if, um, or if they should, should stay. Instead, she leaves it up to you to figure it out. She just gives you the facts. Okay, thank you. Of course, it's a great question. So, um, so we're not writing, so this whole thing is not in first person, it being a third person view, right? It absolutely has to be in third person. Don't okay. Forget. Yeah, don't forget that you're writing in the objective tone. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. And that's uh, the uh, first slide. Uh, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm was reading mine. I'm kind of wrote mine in first person, so I'll probably have to change up. Okay, don't forget you don't want to write it in first person, or it's going to be completely in the subjective tone, and okay. that's going to be no good. Okay. All right. All right, thank you. Yep, keep in mind all four of these things. <laughs> <laughs> all right, are there any other questions? These are amazing questions. Uh, no. No? Okay, all right. Um, well, I think then that will do it for today. And I appreciate you guys so much for, uh, for taking time out of your day. Next week, uh, we will go over conclusion paragraphs. Of course, it'll be a a much shorter webinar um, and it will mainly also cover just the rest of the essay and it will be more Q&A uh, than it will be me teaching and guiding. At this point, we'll just be asking really important questions. So please set your schedules for next Wednesday at noon. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye guys. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.